So the issue that I want to address today is, is that um, so many of our elderly patients, uh, take for instance, a, say an 80-year-old, and the average 80-year-old has about three to four chronic diseases, and for each of those three to four chronic diseases, uh, clinical practice guidelines would recommend probably two or three different drugs. So we're seeing all of these very elderly patients on a, a whole long list of drugs, and I think we're all concerned about whether these drugs are really giving our patients any, any benefit or not. So what I want to try to do today is to give you some sort of science and some sort of method in determining how we might want to limit the use of some of these drugs um, in the old, older patients, especially the frail older patients. So uh, I have absolutely no uh, disclosures to make, uh, and I specifically disclose that I have no interest in the sale or distribution of lottery tickets and in fact, I have never ever bought a lottery ticket. Well, that's very <laughs> interesting, and I hope that makes sense to us eventually. And yes, I hope I don't push this podium off the, off the days. All right. So our learning objectives today, then, to understand the limitations of, of clinical practice guidelines as applies to, uh, to the very old and those with multimorbidity, to introduce the concept of payoff time, and to assess specific clinical practice guideline drugs with regard to payoff in the elderly. Uh, conditions such as hypertension, uh, coronary heart disease, heart failure, atrial fibrillation, osteoporosis, diabetes, etc. And I want to develop a heuristic approach to clinical practice guideline prescribing in older adults. Heuristic meaning rule of thumb or informed guesswork. Okay. So some of the problems that have been stated with clin clinical practice guidelines is that they are single system guidelines for the optimal management of a, di of a disease viewed in isolation that randomized controlled trials on which they are based often excluded or underrepresented the elderly and those with multimorbidity, and that rigid adher adherence to CPG prescribing recommendations results in polypharmacy along with the attendant adverse drug reactions. But in particular, they make treatment recommendations without regard to life expectancy. And that's a problem with the elderly because they're all looking at limited life expectancy. If clinical practice guidelines are followed, this is what may happen. Boyd and colleagues took a hypothetical 79-year-old woman with osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, hypertension, diabetes, and COPD, which for me in the specialized seniors clinic is just an average typical patient that I would see. But this patient, if you follow guidelines, would require 12 different medications taken in 19 doses at five administration times. And every man age 75 or greater would score enough Framingham points just from age alone before adding anything for hypertension or lipids or anything like that. So that man would fall into the high risk category, greater than uh, 20% uh, on the Framingham score, and a statin would be indicated regardless of his cholesterol level. Do we really mean that? A bisphosphonate would be indicated in 90% of all women in complex care. Do we really mean that? One of the problems with clinical practice guidelines, even if we had guidelines for the elderly, is that the elderly are such a heterogeneous sort of group. So here we have some elderly people up at the top there. We have golfers. Down at the bottom, we have the old fellow in the nursing home. On the left, we've got the spunky centenarian. And on the right, we've got a woman who's probably only 63 years old, but she's prematurely disabled. How could any guideline apply to all of that group of people? So I'm going to give you three patients, and we're going to present the three patients, and then we'll come back to them uh, later on. So the first lady is this 85-year-old widow who is living alone in a condo. She's independent for everything. She drives a car. She does everything for herself. She doesn't need help from her family. Her uh, history is quite clean. She has some osteoarthritis in her knees, and she has hypothyroidism. She's not on many meds. She's on thyroxin and some diclofenac gel for her knees. The problem is that her blood pressure at routine visits, multiple visits, has been averaging around 172 over 68, and you've confirmed this by having her do it at home um, as well. You've also ruined out, ruled out secondary causes of hypertension. So the question then, after three months of lifestyle intervention, should she receive an antihypertensive agent? If so, what would be her blood pressure goal? Now, you've, you're a good doctor, and you've heard the lecture about how treating hypertension isn't just about treating the blood pressure. It's about global vascular protection. So you've also done a Framingham score on her, and you find that her score is 25% is 10-year risk of, of hard coronary uh, 
um, events. So should she have a statin and should she have prophylactic ASA? Patient number two, so 81-year-old lady with Alzheimer's disease who has been living on her own at home. She also has type 2 diabetes, uh, coronary heart disease in the form of a remote MI, and hypertension. So she fell at home, and she broke her hip, and it was decided at the hospital that she couldn't go back to living at home, so she's been placed in a care facility. And now here you are at the care facility at the first patient care conference, um, and these are the medications that, that she's come back from the hospital with. So she's on hydrochlorothiazide, ramipril, gliburide and metformin, atorvastatin, aspirin, escitalopram, acetaminophen, vitamin D, calcium, and senesides. So the question arising at the first patient care conference is, she's come back without an antiresorptive agent. So she's got osteoporosis, obviously severe osteoporosis if she can have a hip fracture. But she hasn't been treated for that. So should we start her on an antiresorptive agent, usually a bisphosphonate? Also, her A1C is 7.3%. Should we intensify her treatment for diabetes? And she has a history of MI, and should she have a beta blocker added? OK, patient number three. 86-year-old man lives in a room and board facility, cognitively well. He uses a four-wheeled walker because he has arthritis in his hips and knees. His history includes hypertension, past coronary heart disease, past CVA with little residual. His medications, hydrochlorothiazide, amlodipine, perindopril, aspirin, rosuvastatin, B12, and vitamin D. The problem is that he comes for just his routine visit and you check his blood pressure, and in doing so, you note that his pulse is, is irregular. He's asymptomatic. You confirm that it's atrial fibrillation. So the inevitable question then is, should we be treating him prophylaxing him for stroke with uh, an oral anticoagulant, or would we just keep him on the aspirin? If we use an or oral anticoagulant, should we continue him on the aspirin because of his coronary heart disease? All right, uh, oh, and for the record, uh, his CHADS-2 score was four, and his HAS-BLED score was two, which is intermediate. So we'll come back to these three patients uh, later on. So here's a rule of thumb. Um, I, I've heard it said in the past that the elderly are an evidence-free zone, that the rules don't apply. <laughs> and I, I think that would be unfair to them and a mistake, because in many cases, there have been studies done on the elderly, such as the ones I mentioned here, HIVET in hypertension, BAFTA and WASPO for anticoagulation in atrial fibrillation, senior study for beta blockers in heart failure, Jupiter and PROSPER for, for statins. And inevitably, when these studies are done, they show that the efficacy of these drugs is the same in the um, elderly. Um, efficacy in these studies in is inevitably uh, expressed as a relative risk uh, reduction. And the relative risk reduction is usually the same, maybe a little bit lower. But on the other hand, the absolute risk reduction is actually greater in the elderly because the events rate is, is higher in the, in the elderly. Efficacy is not the same as benefit. So other determinants of, of benefit, well, you have the absolute risk reduction, which is one of the more important. So that would be like saying, what is the likelihood of something bad happening to this patient this year? There's life expectancy, something which we don't usually give a lot of consideration to. Other factors uh, determining benefit would be comorbidity, uh, co-pharmacy, what other drugs the, the patient is on, um, and patient preference. Now, I want to give you uh, an example, and that's aspirin when, when used for primary prevention of, of cardiovascular disease. So the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommends using aspirin uh, for prevention of MI in men and stroke in women, depending on their Framingham score. Um, now, it is based on data like the antithrombotic trialists collaboration, which is a meta-analysis which includes almost 100,000 uh, patients. So it shows uh, a relative risk reduction of 12% of uh, serious vascular events with a wonderful uh, p-score because of the large numbers. So it's on that basis they make this recommendation. Now, I've worked out the absolute risk reduction for this. Um, and incidentally, um, these absolute risk, risk reductions are not obvious in the articles. I've had to really dig and calculate uh, 
to, to work out the absolute risk reduction. But for aspirin in primary prevention, the absolute risk reduction per year is 0.06%. Can you imagine that, you know? You could say to your patient, take this aspirin and you'll have a 12% lower risk of, of vascular events. Or you could say to the, the patient, take this pill and you'll have a 0.06% risk of, lower risk of, uh, of events. And it's exactly the same drug. I worked out the number needed to treat for that, and it would be uh, 1,666 people you'd have to treat for one year to prevent one vascular event. And the absolute risk increase for major bleeding would be half that number, 0.03% uh, per year. So just who among your elderly or even adult patients would stand to benefit from this kind of change? Well, I'd like you to introduce you to Methuselah, um, who, according to the Old Testament, lived to be 960 years um, of age. Now, if he had just chewed a little bit of willow bark each day, he might have made the millennium, I, I, I would think. But, <laughs> but short of, of Methuselah, there aren't many of us who are going to be around long enough to, to, to benefit from this drug. So the two principal determinants of payoff, then, are the absolute risk produ reduction expressed on a per-year basis and life expectancy. And basically, we're looking at, at the product of absolute risk reduction times life expectancy. The most non-judgmental way of assessing life expectancy is to consult Statistics Canada life tables. I actually keep them in, in my office, and I would encourage you to do so, or at least to have access to them um, online. Uh, am I talking too quickly by any chance? Because no. I thought it was. I guess. I looked up my own life expectancy on the tables, and it's 20.4 years. And ever since then, I've been trying to do everything at warp speed. Because I <laughs> another, another way of doing it is, is using a clinical tool, because, of course, the, the life expectancy is just the median of all people. Uh, you can use a clinical tool like the Health and Retirement Study for your mortality tool. And I think I don't really have time to go through it in detail. Um, if we have time, I'll come back to it um, afterwards to show you what clinical aspects of the patient actually are the big, biggest determinants of, of life expectancy. So here's some rules of thumb for you, because you're going to have to start thinking about life expectancy. So I want you to note that at age 80, the median life expectancy for men is 8.26 years and for women is 10.03 years. And at age 90, men 4.34 years and women 5.13. So here's a couple of benchmarks. Why don't we just say as a rule of thumb that life expectancy at age 80 is 10 years and at age 90 is five years. So a couple of reference points to hang on to that are easy to remember. Nursing home residents have a life expectancy under five years, and that's based on this data. So nursing home residents have a median survival of 31 months, and in another study from England and Wales, they have a yearly mortality of 30.8%. So as a rule of thumb, let's just say that for nursing home residents, let's assign them a life expectancy as a rule under Five years. So my friend is the admission to long-term care here is in 22 months. Average life expectancy. Well, okay. So the the comment is about the here that the the uh, life expectancy is 22 months. Um, it's very hard to get good data on that because you know, for instance, I, I asked Fraser Health what their numbers are. And they say 1.6 years, which must be not far off, off that. But that's, that's, um, that's actually uh, length of stay. And there are other factors involved in length of stay than actual mortality. And I, I would imagine that your figures don't use mortality because, for instance, if somebody goes to hospital and stays for more than 30 days, they consider that a discharge and a readmission. So that, that's, that, that may be polluted data that you're, that you're looking at. This study here actually looked at mortality confirmed by, by death certificates. Certainly, the, the, the length of, of stay has come down and down and down. It's harder to get into care facilities. And, and the other aspect of that is that mortality is very high in the first year. And if you make it through the first year, then it tails off quite, quite a bit. So here's a rule of thumb. Uh, treat golfers like any other non-old adults and as assume that they have a life expectancy, let's say, greater than 10 years. And when we say golfers, we don't really mean people who swing golf clubs. We mean elderly people who are still fully independent and capable, capable of vis vigorous activities. So 
Drugs for primary and secondary prevention, which are what nearly all the CPG drugs are, they're very much like playing the lottery. So many play the game so that a few can win. And most people who take these drugs will never benefit from them. Uh, and just like the winners of lotteries, and you, you see on the television the people who win lotteries, and, and they're people who usually buy a ticket every week, week after week, year after year. They buy a whole lot of tickets before they, they, they win the lottery. And, and CPG drugs are kind of like that. And so here's down at the bottom, you've got the, the product of absolute risk reduction times the number of years, which is uh, like winning the lottery. Okay, now here I've worked out a system, and, and, and this, folks, is a, is, this is a BC first. Nobody has ever tried to do this before, <laughs> and it's born right here in the Kootenays, where all sorts of wacky things happen. So um, this is my, my system, and, and, and I put this out to uh, an expert panel consisted, uh, consisting of me. So <laughs> I, I, am going to, I am going to rate these uh, CPG drugs with either one ticket, two tickets, or three tickets. And for one ticket, that would have an absolute risk reduction of less than 1%. And you would have to have a life expectancy greater than 10 years in order to ever benefit from that. And for two tickets, that's an absolute risk reduction of 1% to 4%. And you'd certainly have to have a, a, a life expectancy greater than five years in order to benefit from that. And I think that's being conservative. And three tickets, that's a big payoff. So you'd need a big payoff if you were, had a life expectancy under five years, and so you'd want an absolute risk reduction greater than 4%. This is my own system, but follow me with it. I've spent countless hours working on the products that, that follow this, because these articles do not give you absolute uh, risk reduction. If they do, it's not on a yearly basis. It's on you know 4.2 years or something. I'm going to take you on a tour through the major guidelines. Uh, and in each, each case, I'll, I'll give you a rating uh, for these, these drugs. So here's the first one, arterial hypertension. So these drugs are for the primary or secondary prevention of stroke, heart failure, and to a lesser extent, coronary heart disease. And you probably don't normally think of antihypertensive drugs as being primary prevention or secondary prevention, but that's exactly what they are. So in this case, I used data from HiVet. So that's the hypertension in the very elderly uh, trial. And HiVet, uh, from that, I calculated that the absolute risk reduction is about a half a percent for stroke and 1% per year for hypertension. But that doesn't include all of the endpoints because there are others like coronary heart disease and, and kidney failure and so on. So I think we could conservatively say that the benefit per year is, is 2% or greater, earning it the coveted two-ticky rating on, on my, my system. The caveat, however, is that we should be treating using high vet style management. And I say that because previous meta-analyses of treatment of systolic hypertension in the elderly have shown reduction of stroke um, and cardiovascular events, but they've all shown an increase in, in overall mortality rates, not a decrease. And HiVet was the first study that actually showed a decrease in overall mortality. So HiVet style management, here we are, don't start treatment below 160 millimeters systolic without compelling reason, and there may be compelling reasons. Use 150 as the, as the uh, target. Um, and other studies have used 130, 140, and they're the ones that mostly have shown increased mortality. Um, start with a low-dose thiazide, either in dapamide, uh, 1.25 milligrams, or hydrochlorothiazide, 12.5 milligrams. If you don't get to target with that, don't increase the dose of the diuretic. Go on to an ACE inhibitor as, as, as the next uh, level. And of course, check the blood pressure sitting and standing. So aspirin for a primary prevention of cardiovascular disease, we've, we've already discussed this. And sensibly, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society guidelines don't agree with, with the US Preventive Services guidelines. And they do not recommend using uh, aspirin for primary prevention. And as previously stated, we've given it the special Methuselah rating. OK, aspirin for secondary prevention is a different matter. Um, and it gets a two-ticky rating. But it depends on who you're treating and, and why. So if you restrict yourself to the immediate post-MI patients, you actually get a very high payoff in, in those patients. Whereas if it's, if it's stable ischemic heart disease, remote MI, then it's about a 1.8% uh, payoff. Um, and for stroke and, and TIA, it's considerably lower at 1.2%. This agrees with another meta-analysis that was done, the antithrombotic trialist collaboration, from which I calculated a 1.5% per year uh, payoff. Treating other kinds of vascular disease, like peripheral arterial disease, much lower um, uh, payoff, uh, so 0.5% uh, per year. 
for peripheral arterial disease. Okay, statins for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. Uh, I've used two studies here. One is PROSPER and the other is uh, JUPITER. PROSPER was just in the elderly. JUPITER had a, a quite a large subgroup of, of elderly. Using PROSPER data, uh, you get a 0.22% uh, uh, payoff, which is quite low. JUPITER, uh, quite a bit higher at 1.23. It's likely that PROSPER is an underestimate because the, their endpoints were only fatal and non-fatal MI and stroke, so they're missing quite a few endpoints in, in there. JUPITER is likely an over estimate because patients, uh, subjects in that study had to have uh, an elevated CRP as well, and we don't normally operate by, by CRP. So overall, I'm going to give it a one and a half uh, ticky rating. The outcome of that is that really it's not suitable uh, primary prevention for people, say, over 80, people with, with uh, less than a 10-year life expectancy. And if we're not going to treat them for primary prevention, why bother checking their lipids? So I would say that's almost a rule of thumb there, is people over 80 or people with a life expectancy under 10 years, <coughs> skip the lipids, unless you're talking secondary prevention. So statins for secondary prevention, uh, again, it depends on the subgroup. Um, if you take a fresh uh, MI, uh, so in Prove It Timmy uh, study, there was an 8% payoff for intensive statins, and not 8% uh, compared to placebo, but 8% over and above moderate dose uh, statins. So there's a huge payoff for uh, high dose uh, statins after MI. Jeanette, did you? No, oh, oh I, I can't finish in five minutes. Can I go a little bit longer? Uh, stable ischemic heart disease, a lower payoff rate, about 1.5%. For Think of statins as being for coronary heart disease. For other reasons, statins don't work at all well. So for a stroke and TIA, we're down uh, below 1%. And for peripheral arterial disease, it's so low that they're not even recommended by any uh, guidelines. Anti, uh, atrial fibrillation and anticoagulation, the payoff is potentially very high. So you'll notice uh, on the right from the Framingham Heart Study how the risk of stroke from atrial fibrillation is, increases exponentially with age. It also increases exponentially with CHADS-2 score. Uh, so potentially the payoff can be very high with, uh, for anticoagulation. We do have the benefit of two studies that were done strictly on the elderly. Uh, the BAFTA, which is a large study, uh, and for that I, I calculated that the payoff was 2%. And that's 2% over and above aspirin, not 2% compared to placebo, but so it's probably 3% or, or, or more. And WASPO, a smaller study. But interestingly, in both BAFTA and WASPO, they found that the bleeding risk from aspirin was higher than the bleeding risk from the oral anticoagulant. Um, perhaps not so in younger people. That, that hasn't shown up. But in these elderly trials, if the reason you're not using aspirin is because you want to avoid bleeding risk, it's actually lower with aspirin, with, lower with uh, the oral anticoagulant. Sorry, that Birmingham study used everyone was on an algorithm run by Birmingham Group, two, two doses of water. Everybody was on an algorithm, too. So, so in other words, you know that their INRs were therapeutic as compared to the usual primary care patient who's probably the therapeutic. Shown to be much okay. safer than us just okay. the dose out on a Wednesday okay. evening. Right, okay. But of course now we're, we're also using novel oral anticoagulants quite a lot where we don't have to worry so much about the subtherapeutic uh, aspect of, of that. Thank you. So beta blockers for heart failure, two ticky rating. Uh, so for the senior study, which is a nice study because for once they didn't use a low ejection fracture as, uh, fraction as one of the criteria for um, enrollment. Um, and they had about a 2% reduction in mortality and cardiovascular hospitalization. Bisphosphonates for primary prevention, not a very high rating. Um, if you look at um, the FIT study, um, I calculated a 1.82% uh, payoff from that, which should give it a two-ticket rating. But um, as Dr. Dawes was just pointing out with uh, warfarin, one of the limitations here also is the efficient proper use of these drugs. And so studied patients take their bisphosphonates. The rest of the world don't. Um, and in fact, um, adherence is, is so low. Uh, the mean adherence with a bisphosphonate, you know, with the usual weekly uh, regime of bisphosphonate is 184 days. So that's a half a year. So uh, six months out, of all the people you start on their weekly alendronate, only half will be taking it at six months. 
and only 30% will be taking it in one year. So I, I have downgraded the, the rating on this because of, of that uh, persistence uh, issue. Now this is from a, da a Cochrane database, Alendronate for secondary prevention. The numbers are much better here. They're also very much age-related, increasing as, as the patients get older. So for vertebral fracture, uh, you get a, a payoff of 4.4%, which rises as high as 12.6% by the time you get to the 90s. For non-vertebral fracture, not as good, 1.4% uh, rising to 8.1%. And for hip fracture, quite poor, uh, starting at 0.1%, but eventually uh, getting up there. So the rating is hard to make because it really depends on, on who you're treating and why you're treating them. So it does increase with age. The payoff increases with age. But it's also much higher for vertebral uh, fracture than it is for non-vertebral uh, fracture and especially hip uh, fracture. I think more and more I, I'm, I'm pushing IV zoledronate um, and there were two horizon trials that looked at zoledronate. There's the pivotal fracture trial which was all women older. It's a mixture of primary and secondary prevention unfortunately. Some had low T-scores and some had fractures. Uh, the payoff was 1.6 percent um, for that mixed group. Uh, in the Horizon recurrent fracture trial, now I think this is a great study because it, it took a group of patients who had hip fracture and they were all given IV zoledronate within 90 days of their hip fracture. Um, and the payoff there was 2.6% uh, per year. Um, and, but there was an additional bonus in that there was a 1.8% payoff in terms of reduction of mortality. So having decided that we're in the right kind of ballpark, whether we even want to consider using these drugs, is there's a number of factors that might then help you, help push you off the fence in one direction or the other, such as is the risk of an event higher than usual in this case? So that would be like your, your patient with a, uh, a CHAD score that's higher, that's five or six or, or whatever. Is the risk of an adverse uh, drug event greater in, in this case? So that might be the has bled score that's particularly high in a patient. Are there too many competing risks for bad outcomes? So that might be your COPD patient who's on home oxygen. Um, consider patient preferences always. And will I trigger a prescribing cascade? And that's all too common in, in older folks when you start prescribing. You decide you want to add in a, a calcium channel blocker for their hypertension. So the next thing is they've got edema in their legs. And so you now add a diuretic. And you add the diuretic. And now they've got hypokalemia. So you add a potassium supplement and on and on. So I tend to draw the line very quickly at drugs that, that are often going to create a prescribing cascade. And will excess polypharmacy reduce the, the, the possible benefits? OK. So back to our, our three patients. Uh, so this was our lady, uh, quite fit, 85-year-old uh, lady with systolic hypertension. Her actuarial life expectancy is seven years, although I wouldn't be surprised if she does better because she's quite fit. We know that the treatment of hypertension has an absolute risk reduction of about 2% per year. So I'd be inclined to, to suggest to her that she, she have this treatment. I, I wouldn't be overly upset if she refused it for some reason. But let us say that in this case, her EC sh ECG showed left ventricular hypertrophy, and her EGFR was uh, 51. Uh, so in this case, we would say that her risk of, of a bad outcome is actually considerably higher than the average. So this would certainly sway me towards uh, treatment in her case. As for aspirin for primary uh, prevention, forget it. As for statins for primary prevention, the payoff is very small. Perhaps I would half-heartedly suggest that she could have this treatment if she really wanted it, and she would probably say no, picking up on my half-heartedness, and, and I'd be quite happy if she did. Um, osteoporosis, uh, this lady with the hip fracture and, and the dementia, and those were the questions about the bisphosphonate, the diabetes, and, and the beta blocker. And um, so in 2012, the American Diabetes Association um, put out their consensus report on diabetes in older adults. And they have suggested that we relax the treatment guidelines for people in this lady's kind of condition, and say longstanding diabetes, older patients, higher risk of hypoglycemia. So they're saying that an 8 to 9 percent um, A1C is, is perfectly fine in a lady like this. They furthermore say don't use gliburide in the elderly because of its particularly high rate of, of hypoglycemia. Uh, so let's say that in this case that uh, her A1C was 7.3%. We stopped the gliburide, maximized the uh, metformin, and, and, hope, and thankfully her GFR could, could handle that. Her A1C rose to 7.8%, and we were all happy. 
A statin has a low probability of payoff, e even though it's secondary prevention, but her life expectancy being a nursing home resident is under five years. So the chance of payoff in, in that period of time is, is low, and I, I would not go for a, a statin in that case. The beta blocker question was a trick question because they're, they're actually not recommended in, in the guidelines for people with stable ischemic heart disease. They're only recommended for patients who have had ACS and then for three years, or if they have heart failure, or if they have reduced ejection fraction, but they're not recommended for all people with uh, ischemic heart disease. As for our uh, fellow in the room and board facility with uh, atrial fibrillation, um, his life expectancy is 5.65 uh, years. His CHAD score is, is quite high. They say his stroke risk is 8.5 percent. It's actually probably quite a bit higher than that because um, the age factor ramps it up a lot, and the fact that he's already had a stroke previously really ramps it up a lot. So we're probably looking at a very healthy stroke uh, risk there. Aspirin will reduce that risk by 20 percent, oral anticoagulation by 68 percent. His Hasblad score is, is not bad. Uh, so we know that the payoff is, is greater than 3 percent. Uh, I would have, uh, we know that aspirin is as dangerous as, as oral anticoagulation in the elderly. I would have encouraged him um, to have anticoagulation, and I would have encouraged a, a novel oral anticoagulant if he, could, uh, if he could pay for it. As to the question of whether he should have aspirin as well, and I see that so often that people are on both aspirin for their ischemic heart disease and on warfarin. It's not recommended by the uh, Canadian um, guideline, antiplatelet guidelines, except under very special circumstances, like you for 12 weeks after an ACS and after a stent for a certain period of time. But most people should not be on both aspirin and, and warfarin. So in summary, and I apologize if I've gone over a little bit, the problems with applying CPGs to the elderly is not so much the lack of data or the failure of inclusion of the elderly and the multimorbid in RCTs, but rather the challenge of applying recommendations for drugs that offer modest risk reduction to a group that may not have the lifespan to realize the benefits. Guidelines and RCTs net need to get better at assessing and expressing payoff time, which they currently don't do at all now. And for our part, we need to get more comfortable with estimating life expectancy. Use the CPG recommendation as a starting point, then apply good heuristics and factor in patient-specific modifiers, including patient preferences. And that concludes my talk. And do we have time for questions? Okay. <laughs>